Draw. Okay. Carolyn Davies is a nurse practitioner who with her husband, Merv Richards, has been active in the Amherstburg community since they made it their home in 1998. She has been on the board of directors of the Canadian Medical Assistance Team for 18 years, working in countries that have experienced disasters. Her most recent deployment was in Haiti in 2021 during the earthquake. She was a team leader for CMAT during the 2010 Haiti earthquake, deployed to other places such as the flood area of Bangladesh and earthquake in Kashmir. She was a nurse practitioner with Erie St. Clair CCAC for 10 years. She's president of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, Essex chapter, and past president of the Amherstburg Chamber of Commerce. She was an Amherstburg Municipal Councillor from 2010 to 2014. She's active in a number of volunteer organizations, including Amherstburg Community Services and the Amherstburg Family Health Team. Besides her nursing, Carolyn has been a pra practicing as a doula, a birthing coach. As a social activist, she has sat on many boards that reflect social justice. She's qualified in the Humanitarian Charter and Minimum Standards in Disaster Response Project. Beyond her commitment to nursing, healthcare, and social justice, Carolyn and her husband Merv own the Bondi House Bed and Breakfast in Amherstburg and host people from all over the county, the province, and the world. Carolyn has three dynamic daughters and eight grandchildren and three greats. Carolyn. Carolyn. Yes, Stuart, can you share the PowerPoint, please? Thank you for having me. Um, and it's really wonderful to be back um, to share the great humanitarian work that CMED is doing. When I found out it was the Howard Cauley Lectures, I was even more honored to be asked. So thank you very much. Um, and I will be showing some slides. I think that they're pretty soft slides. Uh, and videos, but uh, some people may find the medical view a little bit uh, harsh. Um, I just let you know that the very last video we're going to show was shown on CBC. So um, I just let you know that. Um, the Canadian Medical Assistance Team, CMAT, is a registered Canadian charity, Canadian based grassroots disaster relief organization made up of volunteers, health professionals, and non volunteers non-healthcare non volunteers who selflessly give of their time, the resources to assist and provide relief aid to victims of natural and man-made disasters around the world. We are entirely volunteer run and donor driven. CMAT has been one of the first teams to arrive at the scene of recent global emergencies and has accumulated a database of over 1000 skilled healthcare professionals from across Canada. Of the many deployments and partnerships CMAT has participated in, I'm going to chat about three of them. Ukraine, active medical needs. Thank you. Um, Ukraine's active medical needs, 2022 up to 23, the 2021 earthquake in Haiti and the 2015 earthquake in Nepal. Up until this mission, Sounds like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> um, up until this mission that was in Ukraine, 
All the CMAT deployments have been natural disasters of a nature. With quite a bit of deliberation, the board of directors to which I was on determined our mandate could not preclude Ukraine, our first active combat zone deployment. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about Ukraine. Um, this was the very, um, the very first uh, different deployment, safety concerns for our medical teams, safe accommodation, and multiple other logistic needs uh, had to be considered. We had to find a good fit. CMAT's assistant team met with uh, dignitaries, ministers, um, ministers and others, hospital administrators, and, and healthcare agencies. Over the three months, we had eight teams go in. Over 85 volunteers were sent with 841 outpatient visits of internally displaced persons. Training of locals in psychology first aid was given by our psychologists and the delivery of medical supplies and equipment were provided. A new experience for our team, and I'll just, we'll just change some pictures. Yes, this is the, this is the uh, number of, of uh, people lost in Haiti. Our, we, our assistance team went in to determine exactly where we would be best utilized. I, next one. Next slide. So these were some of the uh, areas set up to see the internally the internally um, displaced people and some of our, our first teams that went in, okay? We had, uh, yes, yeah, so it just shows you we had, in each, each of the teams that went in, we had two doctors. Let's go back, please. We had, uh, go back to the previous slide, please. We had two doctors, two nurse practitioners, one, uh, six RNs and, uh, and uh, logistics. We had one psychologist, uh, we had logistics, pharmacist, and a translator. And we actually had a certified course for local people to learn how to deal with the traumatic aspect of what they were going through. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. And this is just their, they're looking at their logistics. This is a setup of, of people coming in and being um, cared for. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. So these were uh, nits that we took uh, took with us and they were given to children who were, were traumatized. And this is just at one of our setups. This is, uh, the previous picture was of Dr. Fong and uh, one of the R RNs, nurse practitioners. Okay, next. Next slide. Um, they had constant uh, breakout rooms and um, and after after clinics or whatever to review what was needed, where they were going to be going next, and uh, we did a number of different uh, placements in in Poland or in Ukraine. Always careful about the safety of our staff. We were within the boundaries of Poland to be able to go back at nighttime to sleep because it just was not safe enough for our staff to stay in um, to stay in. Uh, Ukraine overnight. Uh, we were near the border where people were crossing over as well. Okay, next. Next slide. So this kind of shows you the different places that we travel to. Um, and you can see, see it moves up, uh, up to uh, including Hebron, and then establishing ourselves up to uh, Dorchuk's. Next slide. Next slide. And now we're, now we're, um, so I just wanted to say, uh, uh, this was a new experience for our team, learning to, to stop care when, when aerial um, sirens went off, the team would get into uh, bunkers, basements, or other self shelters. And overall, it was a, a very unique and different experience for us. It's opened up a number of doors as well. We had just a, we sent in a team following this uh, deployment to uh, Warsaw, Poland, to assist the uh, the Sunnybrook 
surgical team uh, who were going in to help people who had come across into uh, Warsaw for, for uh, uh, more sur uh, surgeries. And our team acted as the um, pre-assessment and recovery team so that the, the uh, team from Sunnybrook could just do the surgery itself and it didn't take away from their teamwork. This, so now we're moving on to, now we're moving on to um, the Haiti earthquake. That was August 14th, 2021. It was a 7.2 magnitude earthquake at 8.29 a.m. And CMATS 14 was on the ground in Haiti within 28 hours. Um, we got the call, we, we, we saw it. We had a board of directors meeting by noon and I was on the highway by, I think it was two o'clock leaving my husband with four grandchildren, which he said he would be fine with. Yeah. Uh, so, so next slide. The, and, and those folks were, those folks were um, kind of our team plus some other colleagues. Um, the epicenter of the earthquake was in uh, Tiburon um, or Las Cayas as we were calling it, Peninsula. A, a lot of st structures injured and killed, and at least 22, uh, 2,248 were confirmed killed and more than 12,200 injured. There were 137, um, 137,500 buildings damaged or destroyed. Our CMAT workers out of the uh, Ulfa um, uh, hospital itself was heavily damaged. Um, the moral of the story is do not put your sewage system within the cement structure of a building if you're in an earthquake zone. So they lost all their water, uh, all their, all of their water, uh, and of course, other electricity as well. Um, so we worked with the, with the hospital team, which was really uh, limited. They only had a few nurses and uh, one or two doctors at a time. Um, private hospital, uh, the nurses hadn't been paid for months. And some of them just after the earthquake just didn't return. They stayed with their families. Slide, uh, slide two, please. But we did work in partnership with the hospital team. Could we show video uh, one, please? The CMAT team's jobs were to assess patients uh, at the hospital and who needed to be uh, airlifted to Port-au-Prince uh, for treatment and surgery. So our job was to determine with whether their injuries were were uh, um, too severe to be uh, to be able to treat it in a hospital that was was fairly shut down. This is the situation at eight thirty tonight. <laughs> We prepared the patients for transport by helicopter. The roads were too unsafe to travel by ambulance, and I'm sure that a lot of you have heard of those now, but they're still too dangerous for us to use ambulances back and forth. Um, uh, next slide, please. So patients were patients for this is a patient uh, uh, who we were transporting by helicopter. Uh, the, uh, as I said, um, and it was a very, um, very basic transport, didn't have gurneys very often. Um, and we were actually, the helicopters used to land at the airport, but it was so far away because then we'd have to transfer these very injured people onto a bus and then from the bus to the, to the airport. Uh, and that wasn't working. So we worked it out with the uh, uh, U.S. Coast Guard to land right at the hospital itself. And you'll see some videos of that. So this is a little guy going in, probably has uh, fractures of the leg and, and we saw more uh, bilateral pelvic fractures than I've ever seen in my entire nursing career. So he's he heading to the, um, to the helicopter. Next.
So this is the helicopter putting the uh, patients onto it. And they were basically on the floor of the, of the helicopter. Um, and that we always made sure that at least one, well, usually one, because we had very little space, uh, one relative would go with them to be there for support uh, when they got uh, Trent, uh, lifted to go to Port-au-Prince tarmac at the airport to be reassessed um, to go into the, to which hospital they would be going into, but they were all expected when they got there. Next slide. The injured were brought to the hospital by almost any means that they had or their community could muster. This is actually a picture of us picking up um, at the other end, Port-au-Prince. We are bringing them uh, off of a, a Chinook, which is the, the uh, helicopter that went down uh, by our, uh, that, our, our military last week, but same kind of helicopter, it's open-ended. And we were, were going in to take them off and get them over to uh, where the ambulances were to take them to the hospitals. The injured were brought to the hospital by almost any means and they, um, that we could muster. Next, next video. Equipment and supplies were adopted often and whatever we could find with whatever we could find. Video, video five. I'll explain it when it comes up. Brought to the hospital. Um, equipment and supplies were adapted uh, with whatever we could find. Pain management helped comfort the patients. And you'll see a picture of that eventually. So this is a little guy getting a little Tylenol. Brave little soul. Oh my gosh, he was, he was just an amazing little boy. Um, and so we're giving him some pain medication here. The paracetamol on Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay. So you'll see, um, there's another go. picture that you'll see what his wounds are. But, so what we did is we, did, we had also he had a broken arm here. Uh, so we devised cardboard and, um, and uh, shaped it for his leg. I was doing a little therapeutic touch there. <laughs> and uh, we used a, a torn drape to uh, uh, lash it on to be, become a splint so we could transport him to Port-au-Prince. Next video, I think. Um, the, yes, that's the right one. Reconnaissance missionary to aid and assist other hospitals to transport injured patients that require a necessary surgery into Port-au-Prince. So I went out with a, with a team of, of uh, workers um, and were assessing whether or not the people would qualify to have to go to the hospital because they didn't have very many orthopedic surgeons in all of the hospitals. So this little lady, she had a double, uh, she had a bilateral pelvic fractures, which because when a house comes down on you and you're, it hits both sides, so both pelvises fracture. Um, and so I was just checking her x-ray and uh, making sure that we had uh, she was a good candidate to transport to Port-au-Prince. Usually the single pelvic fractures could be managed, but uh, not the doubles. Um, so then um, if you could uh, just um, switch uh, to slide uh, one. CMAT team had shifted to Port-au-Prince to assist with incoming patients and make, make a shift receiving area was made on, it wasn't in the, on the tarmac on the side where the planes landed, but just beyond the, the fencing, uh, but it was still, um, it was still a, it was still on the tarmac. Um, and um, a makeshift re a receiving area was made up on that tarmac to receive patients coming from far and wide on the peninsula by other aircraft and helicopters. Sometimes, and in that picture you just saw, that was just, I was, little boy was uh, feeling very isolated and, and wanted his mom. And um, I was just giving him some comfort and holding his hand. Um, uh, he was to be transported to the appropriate hospital. Um, and this uh, comfort uh, did help decrease his fear 
and uh, made him feel a little bit more comfortable. He, is, his, he had other siblings who were also being cared for and mom was kind of spreading herself out. Um, and next slide. Our youngest patient was 11 days old and uh, born at 37 weeks um, gestation. So she was a preemie and she was given giving a love by Valerie, our CMET CEO and, and nurse practitioner and is a pediatric nurse practitioner. So she accompanied her <clears throat> to the hospital. A quick little story about this one. Um, she, the, the, the gentleman in the black is one of the ambulance drivers and um, this is an amazing uh, ambulance team. They're more than an ambulance team. <clears throat> Very social justice minded, but, um, but one of the rules that we were given when we were being um, when we were when we were being orientated was if we happen to be riding in an ambulance, stay at the back and stay low. If you get stopped by the gangs, if they see that it's a foreigner, they might drag you out and take you for ransom. So it was very heavy. So so Valerie, in her in her wisdom, uh, went in the ambulance without telling our security staff. Uh, and, and deliver the baby to the pediatric hospital. And uh, our, our security staff were freaking right out. But she lets, when she got scolded, she just let it roll off her back. Yeah, baby's fine. So uh, she got her, the baby delivered. Uh, video um, F. At night, this is a, a nighttime assessment team working together were amazing. There was a, a team uh, focused on, on one patient each. And even though uh, if we see that slide, it looked like chaos stabilizing patients was done exceptionally well. I was very impressed with the uh, Haitian uh, teams and their skill sets. Um, are we gonna get that video? No. At 36 weeks uh, old, prenatal mom with a, with a bilateral fracture was stabilized and safely transferred to the obstetrical services in the orthopedic surgery. Uh, we're talking about the, the joys of technology, but um, we knew the woman was pregnant and we knew, and she had a bilateral pelvic fracture holding twins. Uh, yeah, there's a few little groans there, but um, we, we didn't know at the time it was twins. And so we had this, it's Valerie, she was amazing. She comes up with this what called a butterfly um, and she attaches it to her iPhone and the iPhone became an ultrasound. And she was able to determine, she, oh my gosh, there's a second heartbeat. So that was really cool. We all felt like we'd become surrogate uh, parents at that time or grandparents at that time. Um, and she got transferred to, to the obstetrical hospital. Probably, we assume she probably had a cesarean section first and then they fixed her hips later. Um, CMAT's commitments uh, com uh, completed. We said farewell to the medical team who carry on. If you can go to the end of the uh, Nepal or the, uh, the um, uh, Haiti videos, you'll see us. How are we doing there? Yeah, so if you look here, it looks like chaos, but each, each, um, each person being cared for, there's a team with them. I think, is this a photograph or a video? She's getting her blood pressure taken. And this is saying goodbye to, to uh, Haiti. We have, we, have, um, we have brought more supplies that are the, the, um, the gentleman who brought us down, uh, packed his Cessna with uh, more medical supplies on his way to pick us up again to take us home. And this is all came off of his little plane to leave in Haiti for the care that we're gonna be giving. Is there another video of the, uh, the last video on that line? The one I want to show you is the one that was shown on CBC, but it'll give you an idea of, of uh, working in unusual circumstances providing healthcare. No, nope. okay, it's not gonna happen, that's okay. So we'll move on to Nepal earthquake. And it was also known as the Gorkha earthquake. Uh, it happened April 25th, 2015 at 11.57. Uh, 
7.8 magnitude. It's always interesting at what time the earthquakes occur. Um, in, in Kashmir, it happened very early in the morning, but it was uh, Ramadan. And so the kids had left for school early. And uh, that's why so many were killed because they were in the schools and the schools collapsed on them. Um, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Haiti, uh, yeah, in Haiti, it was later, but people were already out working in the fields. And same with Nepal, they're out working in the fields. So there was less deaths than if it had happened earlier in the morning or when people were in sheltered areas. Um, and it was a seven point, uh, so the, the Nepal earthquake was a 7.8, which is big. Oh, there you are. That's us. So that, <laughs> we have just arrived after a 25 hour flight uh, from Canada. Um, and so we are heading on the bus, an eight hour trip, which if it was in Canada would probably be a two or three hour trip, but the roads were quite challenging. So we're just saying goodbye to Kathmandu and we're heading off to our, to where the World Health Organization has assigned us. So our, our, our team arrived after 25 hours of flight and the World Health Organization assigned CMET to the epicenter. We always seem to get the epicenter, which is, I guess, a compliment, but it's always challenging when you get there. Uh, earthquake at the Batawa in the Gorka, uh, Gorka district. Um, and as I said, it was an eight hour bus ride through mountains and switchbacks and avalanche roads, uh, bringing us to our destination in the Himalayan mountains. Uh, slide one of that, please. So this is what we came to look at. This is the, the, ta the town of Balawa. Um, and uh, um, the Nepalese, so you can see the damage that, that has occurred. Next slide. And this is a, a private home, but just sheer Rubble. The interesting thing, and I don't know if you heard this story. Maybe I told the story when I was here before of the of the three little pigs. Uh, and uh, is that the right story? And one lives in a one lives in a straw house, one lives in a bamboo house, and the one lives in the brick house. Well, in Nepal, uh, it's a reverse because if you live in a bamboo house, it sometimes stays up because it sways. And if it's a if it's a or a straw house, which is mostly just bamboo or stone, but in a stone house, they don't use mortar. They just stack them in a particular way for thousands of years. They've been doing this, but it does hold well during an earthquake. It just they just rattle down, uh, and so that's what people were dealing with. Okay, uh, um, next slide. So the Nepalese uh, epicenter was devastating, left almost all homes and businesses flattened. So the cat, this is this is in the main um, Kathmandu World Heritage Site. It was it was just totally destroyed with the collapse of the temples and many other, uh, not only in in the center of Kathmandu but in other locations in in uh, in uh, Nepal and. These are these had been mountainous temples that you always think of when you think of Kathmandu. Um, the, uh, the valley between, if you could switch to the next slide, please. So this, and I, I'm sorry, I did try to do my research on the name of this particular uh, god who is there, but he is looking up at this temple which no longer exists. Um, it's very sad, very sad. He was the only thing that survived that and the bricks are here. The foundation was kind of still left, but apparently they're now trying to match the bricks and try to rebuild the, uh, the things. But um, in the in, uh, next slide, please. The Kathmandu citizens worked to stabilize as many faltering business in the old Kathmandu as they could. So we saw this a lot in old Kathmandu. New Kathmandu, the structures were more sound and more earthquake resistant, which says it works. But uh, but uh, certainly in these centuries old buildings, it wasn't the same thing. Um, in the uh, next slide, please. In the valley between the mountains where CMAT set up its field hospital and camp, we saw patients. We also had outreach teams who climbed roads and paths up the mountains to reach the injured and sick who were unable to descend into the valleys. So those who could reach us because they were mobile 
we would treat in our field hospital. And we had younger uh, uh, paramedics and, uh, and uh, nurse practitioners who could climb up the mountains to these little villages. Sometimes it was roads and times it was just paths. And uh, each day they went to a different area. And of course the, the mountain gossip would say, well, there's so-and-so is injured or so-and-so is sick. And they would go there. And we also treated primary care issues as well. Um, and this little lady had, had, uh, had, I was just doing an assessment on her. Next slide. The community started to rebuild with bamboo and, and tarp. After shocks, um, this, we were doing a, an eye cleanse on this woman, she had debris in her eyes. Um, after shocks made rebuilding the stone structures too, too fruitless until things settled. After shocks were extremely uh, frequent, like every hour sometimes, but uh, the, some of the bigger ones were 5.7 and 6.3 after shocks. And I do remember sitting on the rock and I could feel the, an, uh, an aftershock coming. It might've been an earthquake, but an aftershock. I was on a, a rock the size of this hole. We called it Gibraltar. And one of the docks were standing under what was surviving of the little school where we were. And I told them to get off the, the porch in case it collapsed. And we just bounced on this massive boulder, just bounced. And it was, what, what are you gonna do? Just stay just hang on right and it's quite the experience um but they would rock you in your place and wake you from your sleep because many times i thought oh why did i wake up it's two o'clock in the morning and so i said didn't you feel that earthquake oh okay um so it, it but they're happening all the time and usually the dogs and the uh, roosters will let you know ahead of time that they're coming it's very interesting and then they keep going all night long <laughs> uh next photo The, uh, despite the destruction of the villages, people carried on with, with daily living and farming routines. Children still played, teenagers still tried to maintain normal, normalcy. Um, this was a bridge that we crossed every day from our field hospital into the village. And um, this little girl, she's trying to give me a namaste, but she had a whole bunch of toys in her hand. And her mother is giving me a namaste one hand because she's hanging onto her bundle. But everybody says namaste, that was your greeting to everybody. Um, but uh, certainly normalizing activities and they had, it was harvest time. So they, they, the rice fields were uh, about to get flooded and, and then they went ahead and had, had to flood the, the rice fields. The maize harvest had to be brought in and other sustenance work had to continue. And next slide, please. So we had two little girls for, from the village and they would come and sit on that Gibraltar rock every day and watch us work. But uh, I was letting them play with my stethoscope just to kind of make them feel a little bit more comfortable about what was going on. So they were having fun. Next slide. These are teenagers standing on a bridge that was far from stable. There were big, huge gaps on it. The trucks were not allowed to go over it anymore, but were there for driving through uh, the river that's underneath. And I had to also walk through that river and I usually went with somebody else because the current was very strong. And I remember one of our EMS where he was about six four and was not going to float away on anything. And I would just hold onto his belt as we walked through the water to get to the other side because it was just too dangerous to cross the bridge. Um, and there was an avalanche place, which was, I didn't, if I, if I crossed the bridge, I would have to go over this avalanche. And because it was so many frequent aftershocks, this avalanche could easily bring down more rock. So we all decided that we would get our shoes wet and walk across the river instead. So that's how we did it. But it did, it did uh, let you know that life had to go on in teenagers were teenagers, no matter what world you're in. And uh, last picture. And as I said, harvest must, be carry, must carry on. So I wanna thank you for your interest and for more information you can, um, you can uh, uh, go to www.cmat.ca. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or uh, after the service. Are there any questions for Carolyn? Uh, Sue? Uh, was, uh, was it the town? Was it? It was, uh, there's a, there's a plan. 